Thank you very much. Thank, thanks everyone for uh, being here to help us celebrate our 15th uh, luncheon. Seems like it's gone by quite fast. I want to thank all the table captains for the hard work to bring you all together and also thank them for joining us last night to meet with Brian Doyle at uh, uh, Jeff Parker's uh, beautiful home at Lake Oswego. And a, a big thank you to Jeff for hosting that event for the second year in a row. I think it served to bring us all closer together and understand uh, just how important this mission is for, for all of us. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the progress that, that we've made and more importantly progress we can make if we can together make sure we support all the wonderful physicians and scientists who work in the lab and are dreaming up the next great idea and the next cure for cancer. Uh, I know we all hear a lot about cancer and pretty much everybody in the room is probably sitting at a table where someone has had cancer or they've lost someone from cancer. And if you look in the, the news and the internet, in, in the past year you see Robin Roberts uh, going off the air because she has a rare kind of a, a leukemia. Uh, just yesterday there was a CNN anchor woman, 47 years old, going off the air because she's diagnosed with breast cancer. And what led her to make that public was the courage shown by Angelina Jolie, who shared with the public the fact that uh, her mother, who died at a very young age of ovarian cancer, actually had one of these uh, mutations in a gene called BRCA1 or BRCA1. And uh, this led Angelina Jolie to uh, have a, a, a double mastectomy. And these, these celebrities serve an important, uh, as important role models. Their willingness to share publicly their illnesses I think reminds us of the hundreds of thousands of people like us who aren't celebrities who face those same problems. And, and it is hundreds of thousands of people that are, are affected by these illnesses. And we're going to hear a, a few stories from people today who you may not think are celebrities, but they should be celebrities. They're certainly uh, heroes uh, to me. When I, when I think about the, the events with these celebrities, I, you look for and you see common features and I see them in the patients that I take care of. First thing I think to recognize is how everything can change in a heartbeat. You know, one minute everything's okay, the next minute you're talking to some guy like me and I'm saying, you have cancer. And just, you can just feel the chills that, that go down when, when you hear that. Second thing you think about is, it's not just me, this is my entire family and all the people in my world. And if you look at Angelina Jolie's reaction, you can see that's all the things about the paper. Her reaction is, what am I gonna do for my kids? What will it be like without my kid, with my, for my kids without me? What can I do to be here to take care of them? And, and that's pretty much a reaction that we see in, in uh, all of our patients and an and understandable one. It becomes uh, a family battle, if you will. The, I think, importantly, the third common feature is that all of those individuals have face a better future today because the treatments we have today are much better than they were 15 years ago before we started having these luncheons. Robin Roberts has a pretty good chance of being cured because she can get a bone marrow transplant that we didn't really know how to do properly 15 years ago. The anchor woman on CNN has a very high chance of being cured of her breast cancer like our MC Helen Raptus today because we know about early detection. We know about the proper integration of surgery with radiation, when to use chemotherapy, hormonal therapy, and yes, even immunotherapy for breast cancer. And, and think about Angelina Jolie. The test that her mother had wasn't even available in 1996. So she'd been, if, 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 if this had happened 15 years ago, she would have never found out she had this gene. She wouldn't have had her prophylactic surgery. And she probably or highly likely would have developed breast cancer or ovarian cancer and could have died from that disease. And, and, and the fourth feature that all of these celebrities uh, have, have in common with this is that they are all 
the beneficiaries of the investment that we have made in research over the past 20 or 30 years. Their treatment is better than it would have been because people like you invested in people like me and my colleagues to work in the lab, to understand the processes, what causes cancer, why does it behave this way, and, and how do we treat it? And I'm here today to, to ask you to continue to provide that support because we have some wonderful people who are pictured on this slide. Do I have to push the button or? Nope. On this slide. This is, this is not the entire team, but this is a large part of the team. These are the people who need our help. An incredible, incredibly bright group of scientists, physicians, technicians, administrators, uh, clinical, everything you need to, to have a program that brings new treatments from the lab to the clinic for patients with cancer. And it truly is world class. This group has been involved in the development of a prostate cancer vaccine that's now approved for men with advanced prostate cancer. We were part of the earliest studies and these studies for FDA approval of an antibody called ipilimumab, which is the first drug ever to show improved survival in patients with metastatic melanoma. That kind of work has led to our being selected to be one of two uh, large networks. One is a, a, a national network with 27 cancer centers in the U.S. to do immunotherapy trials. The other network is a Bristol Myers Squibb immuno-oncology network, which brings pharmaceutical partnerships together with academia where new drugs get to patients more quickly. And there are five centers in Europe, and the five centers in the U.S. are, are, are Harvard, the University of Chicago, Sloan Kettering, Johns Hopkins, and the Earl A. Childs Research Institute at Providence Cancer Center. So, uh, con congratulations to all, all those guys, because that, that's, that's what made it happen. And so it truly is world-class immunotherapy. And I'm just going to share with you uh, four projects that we have ongoing that I believe are worthy of your support, I think are very exciting, and I think are likely to change how uh, we take care of patients with cancer. I've talked about OX40 before. Here's the team. I was going to use a pointer and point at all the different people, but there are just too many individuals to recognize. Labs led by Andy Weinberg, the basic scientist. All the clinical work was pioneered by Dr. Brendan and Curdy, both of whom are in the audience today. This project was solely a project of philanthropy. Uh, meetings like this, other times, raised $2 million from people like you, produced an anti-OX40 antibody, treated patients, saw clinical benefit, started a company called Agonox. Providence licensed uh, the intellectual property to Agonox. Agonox makes the re relationships with MedImmune and AstraZeneca. And all of a sudden, a $2 million investment by us is probably now a $2 million investment every other month by AstraZeneca to get OX40 into patients uh, around the world. And also, it's led to support for our research program so that we can do more OX40 work and, importantly, uh, try and do better than, than OX40. Uh, a key collaboration with people like you. The other, uh, other uh, major area of interest is in this vitamin E analog called Alpha-TEA, which was developed by uh, my friend and colleague, Emmanuel Akporie, who's uh, on the far right in, in this picture. And this is a, an analog that you'll take in an oral um, preparation. It has amazing anti-tumor effects against breast cancer and also has uh, un unexpected activities in enhancing the immune system. And we think this is going to be a huge uh, benefit to patients with, with breast cancer. And we're just about ready to start a clinical trial. We've had support from the Heath Foundation. We've had great support from the Safeway Foundation. And product is being made. And we expect to be in patients uh, before the end of the year or early next year. And it's, it's another very different way of approaching the patient with, with cancer. I've talked to a couple people out here today, actually someone who, who, who knows about this, this next project and who's uh, uh, dealt with this uh, problem, and, and that is 
glioblastoma multiforme as a terrible kind of a brain tumor, which is pretty much uh, in its uh, latest stage uh, universally fatal. You get surgery, you get radiation, you hope for the best, and the best is usually that it recurs in eight or, eight or 10 months. Uh, and the treatments after that are not very effective. We have a team here that includes radiation oncologists, laboratory people. It's led by Keith Badgett, who unfortunately is not pictured in here. Uh, you would notice him. He's a six foot eight, big, strong guy. And he couldn't be here for the picture because he was in Texas with Sherry Scales trying to, ra trying to raise money so that we could get this project completed and get this into patients. And what this is, it's using a bacteria that's been modified in a specific way to be very immunogenic. That means modified in a way. It's a very safe bacteria. It's one we see all the time, rarely causes disease. But you can insert genes in there that are found on the brain tumor and trick the bacteria into, have the bacteria trick the immune system into uh, recognizing not only the bacteria as foreign, but also the brain tumor antigens as foreign. And this project is being uh, developed in collaboration with a company called Aduro. Marka Crittenton is one of the leaders, and uh, Dr. Bader on the right, uh, a good friend and, and colleague, is also one of the clinical lead investigators. And he has a special interest in this project, as many as do. Uh, his, his brother uh, died from, uh, after a long illness from uh, a, a brain tumor. So lots, lots of very dedicated people involved in these projects trying to bring new therapies to patients who, who need something new. And, and finally, there's this huge team working on this thing called dribbles. It would take too long to explain what dribbles are, but it basically it's a way of treating tumor cells to make them look more foreign by the immune system. So you can take tumors from different kinds of tumors, and then you can make dribbles from them and then use them as a vaccine. You can give it possibly with a normal traditional therapy that doesn't work as well as you wished it would work to make it work better. And this, this is a, a huge team. We've already tried this in small numbers of patients with lung cancer. Rachel Sanborn, whose picture's in the front there, will lead the lung cancer project. Ali Conlin is our breast cancer expert, and uh, Ali, you may have heard her on Lars Larson yesterday or seen her on TV because she's our breast cancer expert. There was a lot of talk about Angelina Jolie and breast cancer. Well, she's working on this as a way to vaccinate women with breast cancer who don't have other options. And then we have a new doctor, Ram Leidner, also in the background because we're working on an international project to try and use this method of treatment for patients with head and neck cancer in, uh, in collaboration with our colleagues at, uh, in Amsterdam. One of the individuals here, uh, Rinica, is a, a postdoc from, from Amsterdam. And, and through her connections and friends we have there, we've put in a stand up to cancer grant to try and take dribbles to the, uh, the clinic. Now, dribbles were, were invented by Dr. Hung Ming Hu and Bernie Fox, who are both pictured in here. And I think many of you ha have met them previously, outstanding investigators. They were also able to start a, uh, a small business based on this. Uh, so you see the, the connection between academic philanthropy and, and, and business. And through the business side of things, they were able to garner a grant for a couple million dollars that will allow us to do the clinical parts of the clinical trials I just talked to you about. So, so the, these are the ideas. They're not all going to work because not, not, not all these ideas ever work. But if any of them work, it will be a very big deal for patients with cancer. And, and, and I, I, I really feel the, the, all these guys are, are, are worthy of our support. I hope you uh, hang in there and continue to support us. And I, I thank you all for, for being here to, to listen to me and to hear other, other parts of the show. Uh, one of the things I want to say, if you see all these people, you can see them. They're all standing in front of this beautiful fountain. And we have this uh, beautiful fountain that was uh, dedicated uh, when the cancer center opened about five years ago in memory of Rosemary Moore. Now, uh, I, I am sorry to say that in the last year, we, we lost our good friend, Bill Moore. Uh, Providence lost a very good friend, and this event lost one of its most loyal supporters. Bill Moore was a member of the Providence Portland Medical Foundation for a decade. 
In these 10 years, he was one of our most loyal and dedicated supporters. Bill's wife, Rosemary, died of cancer, too common a theme, 10 years ago. In her memory, this fountain was established. And Bill used to talk about how proud he was of that fountain, and that fountain is sort of a key hallmark of the lobby of the cancer center. I'll meet you at the fountain. I'll meet you at the fountain outside the, the, the cafe. And I know he considered it to be a fitting tribute to Rosemary's memory. And now I think it's also a very fine tribute to Bill as well. And I, I'd just like to thank the entire Moore family and recognize Bill's sons, uh, Duffy, Kelly, and Dan, who, who, are, who are here with us today and say your, your dad was very special and a great friend to all of us. And then one, one last thing, I'd just like to mention the, that we have an Earl M. Childs Philanthropist of the Year Award, and uh, it's 2013, so it's time to uh, talk about that award. And uh, philanthropy for many, including hundreds of you in this room, accelerates cancer research progress that will benefit not only all of us, but our children and our grandchildren. Beginning in 2008, as the new Providence Cancer Center facility was dedicated, uh, we began recognizing some of our most loyal and generous supporters with an award named after our premier benefactors. The Earl M. Childs Philanthropist of the Year Award recognizes those who have supported our efforts in a visionary way, and past awardees have included the award's namesake, uh, Earl himself, who's not here with us today. But we've also honored Wes and Nancy LaMotta, Jack and Lynn Loacker, and Bob Franz and his sister, Elsie Franz Finley. And we're, we're very proud of our association with all of them and thankful to all of them for their help. But today, we'd, we'd like to recognize another outstanding a partner who's been making a difference in cancer research for uh, a number of years. And I'd like to announce that we've selected as the 2013 recipient of this award, the Safeway Foundation. I don't know how many of you know, but the Safeway Foundation has provided over $4 million to support 10 cancer research, pro 10, 10 cancer research projects here at Providence. And they've done that by getting their customers and employees involved in phil philanthropy at their stores in October and the Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And we're planning a formal recognition sometime in the fall, but we thought we'd take that oppor the opportunity to make the announcement today while everyone is here, we could celebrate together. And I, I did, if it's possible, I wanted to just ask, I think there's a table for Safeway out there, if the people from Safeway could, could stand and we could give you a hand. Uh, there they are over there. It's the white shirt crowd, looks like bankers. So thank you very much.